love running. I love running. My name is Aaron Gustafson, and I'm a myofascial therapist and massage therapist. I've been working in kind of the alternative healing arts for the last 15 years. I've been working with Dr. Ray and Correctos um, in an official capacity for just about a year and a half now, but I have been using the product myself and with my clients and patients for the last almost four years now. Um, and they were an integral part of my own rehabilitation for my feet. So I have personal belief in the product. I also have personal experience with the ups and the downs that you can experience when you strengthen and rehabilitate something that has never been used or has been atrophied and weak for your whole life. Let me invite you to treat this also as a question and answer period. I don't want to give a canned presentation. That's my least favorite way to go through this stuff. I want to address the questions that you guys all have as individuals. Um, show of hands first, who here has experience with Correctos so far? Okay, and so there's something completely new to a good portion of the group, is that correct? All right, well let me back up and make sure I cover some of the bases. Um, simple little silicone toe spacer. It's the only toe spacer on the market that spaces all five toes relative to each other, the arches, and the ground. It's also the only toe spacer on the market that does so that can be worn in footwear while you are weight bearing and involved in all your favorite activities. With the one little asterisk next to it, as long as it's appropriate footwear. Um, Footwear is the main reason why these were invented. They were invented by Dr. Ray McClanahan. He's a natural sports podiatrist here in Portland, Oregon. And he's been a competitive runner and was training to get to, he was almost one spot away from making it into the Olympics. And it was part of what led him into podiatry was the fact that he was always breaking down when he was in these competitive races and he was never to get able to get into the Olympics in that top spot because of the constant injuries that he had. And he met a podiatrist in the process of exploring his own injuries and kind of followed his work and became interested in doing it himself. So he adapted or tried to adapt all of the podiatric fixes, the skills that he was taught through his traditional schooling to his own problem. He had great toes that were crossed over his second toe. And that was one of the issues that was preventing him from running at the level he wanted to. He discovered that the fixes he was taught for problems, bunions, hammer toes, plantar fasciitis, the surgical and the orthotic fixes, they weren't working. And so he started thinking around the problem and he came across the work of a doctor, um, Rossi, William Rossi, sorry, there's a couple of doctors that really influenced his work. Um, and Dr. William Rossi has been writing around, writing about proper shaped footwear and how the footwear that we have is what is deforming our foundation. I gave everybody a handout which says the posture deforming features of footwear. And to describe what those are, there's three main ones. The first one is heel wedge. Traditional shoe shape from the athletic manufacturers, we have a two to one height difference. That's the average between the heel and the toe. So what we see when we elevate the toe, or elevate the heel, it changes the angle at our ankle joint, changes the angle at our metatarsal heads as well. It already brings the toes into a state of extension. Then, one of the things that happens when you build in a rigid platform underneath the foot is it takes away the rolling motion of the tarsal bones during gait. And if you think back to the old um, wooden clogs that you would see from, in like the Netherlands and such, they, that's as rigid as a shoe can get, it's a clunk of wood. And to make it so it rolls, they bend up the front, they call it toe spring. So here we have the heel elevated, we have the toes then even further sprung up into a state of extension, which shortens the extensor muscles and over lengthens the flexor muscles on the bottom of the foot. The other huge error that we see occurring in the footwear industry is what's called toe taper. That's where the shoe companies take a width measurement at the ball of the foot or the metatarsal heads, where if we grew up in a culture where we weren't wearing shoes, 
if our standard way was just to walk around barefoot, our feet would still be shaped like they were when we were born. What's the widest part of our foot when we're born? Anyone? I read, so I'm not going to say. <laughs> <laughs> The tips of our toes. You know, most of us have seen our, our baby certificates or our birth certificates where they put our footprint on there. And the widest part is the tip of the big toe and the little toe. And that's the same thing that you see in adults in uh, cultures that grow up without footwear on. Well, our shoe industry says, hey, our width comes here. And it looks really fashionable and sleek and attractive if we squish the toes together like this. So when we couple those three things together, heel elevation, toe spring, and then toe taper. I don't know if you could just see when I did that, it decouples the bony support for our great arch. And oh, one of the definition, or the definition of an arch is a structure which supports over an open space. How does our footwear industry support arches? What was that? They put something in the shoe half the time. Mm -hmm. They put a pillow underneath it. You know, it's, mm -hmm. if, if we went with the footwear industry's definition of what an arch was supposed to be, when we're driving across the river on a bridge, the river should be a pillow holding that thing up. But it's not. It's an arch which is supported by the structural alignment and the, the integrity of its two ends. And that's the way that our foot is supposed to work as well. If you see the um, modification sheet where you, there's the view of the top of the foot and you can see those green lines going down through the bony rays. That's how the arches of our foot are supposed to work. But our shoes take away the integrity. And the really important thing about our medial arch is it's our body's natural pronation control. We're supposed to be able to pronate with every step. That's part of the shock absorption process in our foot. And if we take away that muscular alignment, one of the main tissues that keeps the great toe in alignment and keeps the arch supported is the tendon of the flexor hallucis longus. It's the longest great toe flexor muscle that you have, and it starts way up here in the back of your knee. It comes down behind underneath the sustentaculum tali little joint on the bottom of your calcaneus and lifts up the talus and it goes down and tracks right through the middle of these sesamoid bones. Sesamoid bone, your kneecap is a sesamoid bone. Sesamoid means floating bone. It's not fixed in place. It's something that our body puts there to give us an additional fulcrum or leverage when there's a long connection and lots of force that goes through a joint. But one of the things that happens when we start to taper our toes together as traditional athletic footwear, the footwear that we do when we're strengthening our body around alignment, that flexor hallucis longus starts to, it inserts on the tip of the toe and it starts to look like the string on a bow and arrow. And because the sesamoids are floating, they start to drift over into the inner space, which if you think about the end of our great arch, the structural support of this bridge that supports us from pronating down into the river with every step, it's a tripod between those sesamoids and the tip of where that flexor house as long as inserts. If the sesamoids start to drift over into the interspace, it's like sitting on the edge of a three-legged table. You can't stay there very long. You start rocking even further. Once we decouple like that, then you're going right down the road into bunion pathology. And that's where that bowstringing of the flexor house as long as pulls even further, and the other support muscle for the arch, the adductor hallucis, which comes off the calcaneus and attaches on the first flange, also starts to bowstring. We <coughs> shorten this distance, and then we shorten this distance, and there is our bunion. The other thing that happens when we are in traditional shoe shape and decoupling that support, the transverse arch starts to collapse. Does everybody know what the transverse arch is in the foot? We have three arches. It forms a tripod, and it's our foundation for our house, our body. It starts at the heel. The great arch goes from that point to the tip of the great toe. That's the medial arch. The lateral arch is from the calcaneus to the fifth toe. And then the third side of the triangle, transverse arch, goes from the ball of the first toe to the ball of the fifth toe. 
and they say that there's a posterior and, a, and an anterior. Um, that arch, you can see it's that curvy dome of the foot this way, and it goes all the way up through the foot. Well, when we go into traditional athletic shoe shape and we're dumping more weight into the metatarsal heads, rather than spanning it across the support of all of our arches, that starts to collapse. So these are some of the things that we bump into when we start to undo this. We need to transition people back to a plumb and level foundation, just like we build our buildings with. You want to start with something plumb and level, or else every structure above that is going to be skewed according to that. And it's a process, because we all didn't grow up barefoot, did we? No, we grew up in these shoes, and that means that our foot and our connective tissue and our bony joints and our ligaments have all adjusted to these tissue and distance relationships. And we have to go through a process of getting people's tissue to lengthen. And it's not fast. You know, that's one of the things that um, correct toes or to do a rehabilitation process like this. Anybody who's familiar with the Goscu already has the prerequisite. I have an active interest in taking care of myself. Um, people who don't have that prerequisite interest aren't necessarily going to be served by this. You can't just put this in your shoe and it's going to take care of everything. You have to think about your shoe. You have to think about your feet. You have to listen to the messages from your feet. So that's what we're doing is we're, we're waking them up and getting them to be a dynamic part of our system that adjusts from step to step to give us the, su the support that we need. And that's the opposite message that shoes give most of us psychologically. Shoes are there to shut our feet up. Just be comfy and don't bother me all day. Take my head where I want to go. Collagen and fascia takes six months to really permanently start to change, at a minimum, a distance relationship in the body, where you're not going to have other symptoms and other things that parts of the structure up above that have been skewed. They're going to get tugged if you start all of a sudden lowering your heel with every new step, and you've been used to only having your heel come this high off the ground with every step. All of those posterior structures have to change. And if you let them change, then all of a sudden the hamstrings and the glutes are like, hey, I've got something tugging me down in the back. All of those tissues need to go through the process of lengthening and changing their relationship with the nervous system. That's where the correct toes, toe spacer comes in very handy because it provides the structure that we need to strengthen around. But we're not there to bully our feet into submission with these and to force them to be around this structure every step of the day. We're there to listen to when our feet and our tissues go, hey, wait a minute, that's been enough of a workout for today. And they do that by giving us an awkward sensation or a feeling in some place where we've never had it before. And that's when you go, wow, feet, thanks for doing this new workout and participating in this with me. I hear what you're saying, you're suffering. Let me take off these flat shoes and I'll go back to my heel wedge shoe. And it's this slow weaning away from heel wedge and elevation and the overextension, we always recommend toe extensor stretches because everybody who's grown up with a heel wedge has some degree of extensor contracture. That's where hammer toes come from. If we can't get our toes flat on the ground and that also then takes away our ability to feel like we have a good hold on the ground, so we're already tight on the top and then we try to grip it. Mm -hmm. And there's our hammer toes, they pop right up. Um, there's a couple of examples of footwear and this is really the most exciting part of the correct toes realm over the last year and it's been driven by the runners it's been driven by vibram five finger shoes and everybody going what's up with those gorilla feet and what's this barefoot running craze well two years ago um, in the running stores minim minimal footwear and stores that actually stocked it here in town there's one that had seven percent of their sales were minimal footwear last year it was 15 percent this year it's growing even more so the shoe companies are finally realizing that there's something to this and they're putting out options for us to wear. Two years ago, I would have showed you Crocs and Birkenstocks as like the only shoes out there that had a wide enough toe box to accommodate these. And Birkenstocks tend to be a little bit too rigid because we want to strengthen the foot to get to that place where it can control that motion on its own. While we are in that process, we want to Again, wean ourselves down slowly and transition. So there's different levels of shoe. If we're coming from a motion controlling shoe, we're not gonna want to go to something right away that is um, 
moccasin-like or just completely flexible and smushy. That is throwing too much work to our feet right away and we can get some too much too soon or overuse injuries coming from folks or aggravate other things in that process. So we often recommend going to something that does have a little bit more structure. This is an ultra shoe, um, shoe industry term for level, zero drop. Drop refers to the amount that the ball of the foot is lower than the heel. So if you are coming from you know, your Brooks running shoes and you're wanting to make this transition, you're probably not gonna be ready to go straight to a zero drop all the time. And there's minimal shoes out there that do have varying degrees, like there's a four millimeter drop and a two millimeter drop. Um, and it's okay to spend a few months working in one of those shoes that is a lesser version of heel wedge, knowing that it's a part of the transition to getting to something that is flat and plump. Questions about shoes popping up for you so far? Am I providing enough answers? Okay. And feel, you know, at any point in time, if somebody's like, hey, wait a minute, and you have a question, just throw a hand up and we'll address that at the time. I um, have a question. You mentioned the Crocs, mm -hmm. and I have a friend who's but I just told her to wear those. What is the advantage of the Croc other than white? So. The other advantage of the Croc is that it asks you to control your own foot because it doesn't lace, it doesn't snug down on your foot. If we're talking about the mm -hmm. same model of Croc, it yeah, does just, ones that just look like a big piece of rubber. Uh -huh. Yeah, and that's um, because each step you can slide around in there a little bit, but you do have room to splay your toes. Okay. And that's the thing that we get the most control over is when we can have our tripod in alignment in our foot, we really get a much more tactile experience of interfacing with the ground. It's kind of like you know taking our hands from this position and going, well, what does it feel like if I actually grab something? Yeah. And so that's what the Crocs start to enable. We also, um, met pads can be a very useful addition. What the met pad does, here. these help rebuild the structure of the transverse arch, the one that goes across the toes that I was describing to you. So you can see if you look at the profile of this, it has just a little bit of a dome shape. And it's counterintuitive to people because they hear me saying, well, we're trying to get your toe in line so your soft tissues can support your arch. And then put this little pad underneath your foot. And well, wait, isn't that an arch support? Well, it is, but not for your great arch, not for your medial arch and not for your, your lateral arch. It is a support for the transverse arch, which for many people has already collapsed and become condensed and form many adhesions in there that keeps the things from rebuilding. Well, the process of spacing the toes and getting the ends of the arch structure out in place, at the same time we lift the shafts and this little dome not only lifts the shafts of metatarsals two, three, and four, it also pulls slightly on the intrinsic flexor muscles on the bottom of the foot, which brings the toes flat and in contact with the ground. Um, one of the other insidious aspects of that extensure, extendor, pardon me, extender contracture, <laughs> is that it gently pulls the fat pads, the natural cushioning that's supposed to be underneath our metatarsal heads, it pulls it up into the sulcus. And so that's another part of the process is we have to let that cushioning slowly move itself back and underneath and that's what the metatarsal pad also helps with by lifting those shafts, pulling the tips of the toes down and encouraging that cushioning back underneath the metatarsal heads. These are meant to be rehabilitative and not a crutch or something that you lean on for the rest of your life. We do have patients and clients who choose to wear them. Those tend to be the folks that have had very severe pathologies. You know, one example being our own Dr. Ray. He prefers to run with correct toes on all of the time because he never wants to go back to that place where he was before and breaking down. If you don't have that level of severe pathology, and I would be an example of this, I worked with correct toes for about eight months and then my feet were asymptomatic and doing everything I asked them to and, 
and yeah, I basically get to enjoy living in my feet. And so I gave mine to my dad. So it's an, another new concept to a lot of people when they're interfacing around foot health. Um, the big idea out there is that our foot is incapable of supporting us. And once it breaks down, you're always going to need something from the outside to help you with it. And that's not quite the case. Yes? What would be <coughs> symptoms that would um, suggest that correctives would be beneficial? What are some examples of symptoms? Symptoms? Um, heel pain, plantar fasciitis, uh, bunions, hammer toes, corns, ingrown toenails. These are all pathologies of compressing our feet and keeping them hot and warm in an incubating environment as we smash them in weight bearing all day long. Let's suppose we just stick with bunions. So okay. if you start wearing correctos, what's going to happen to the bunion? What first thing is that um, as long as you are making the step to not cram your foot back into footwear that tapers that toe tip in, what you're going to do is you're going to start to notice symptom reduction pretty much immediately. Which where, means? Which a lot of the bunion symptoms is you'll get pain where that bump on the bunion bumps into the shoe mm -hmm. or where the toe comes in and hits the other toenail will get, um, okay. it will get red and hot and inflamed. You might even get, you know, rub blister there. Mm -hmm. um, the, muscles feel overstretched and over attenuated because they're being pulled so tightly and we're, we can't get the structure out where we actually can experience the support. Let me back up a little bit. When we can experience the integral bony support, and that's where the vector of force, like every time if I tighten this and I put force in through that and it's going through each center of the joint capsule, then we feel central bony structure that our soft tissue can relax and drape off of, rather than fighting big logs that are out of alignment and trying to pull them back into alignment. And so that's one of the first things that people feel is as the structure gets out to where it is, they can actually relax a little bit and let those muscles, the very muscles pulling the bunion alignments further into pathology, they get a break. And when you release tension, you get blood flow. And when you get blood flow, you get tissue regeneration. When you get tissue regeneration, you get more strength, you get more mobility. Um, is this helping? Yeah, thank you. That's <laughs> okay. great. Thank you. Um, what if you've had surgery, and I've had surgery on one foot by three different doctors that I feel didn't do the right thing. One took a tendon out, and so now the toe goes this way. The other one stiffened the toe, so that one goes that way. So can those be helped, those kind of problems be helped with these? Or is it just your, what's already natural in the going on with the foot? It can't replace a tendon, um, but they are very useful post-operation to regain mobility, to encourage proper alignment. Um, they're actually, it's something we really recommend if someone does actually need a procedure and it's where they do have mobility. That's the one thing is if they fuse joints to where they can't move, then you're not gonna increase mobility there. But what we do find is a lot of people after they get bunion surgery, they'll get very rigid. You know, hallux rigidus is when that, the great toe doesn't wanna flex anymore. And you do have to have some degree of mobility to be able to work with these because the goal is to increase mobility <coughs> and support. So I don't know if I'm answering your question very well. Well, okay, so there are two toes that are out of, my, out of control of my body, actually, because of what was done. So okay. if one is going this way, can it, by correcting the other ones, it could have, could it have some can, can you move that toe? that doesn't have, my hand. that doesn't have the tent. Yeah, it doesn't have mobility at the joint where, you know, if you look at it and you tell it to move, you can't move it because you don't have a tendon. But if you, you grab can, it with yeah, your hand, yeah. okay, then that would be a good indication that, that it's worth a try to see how your foot, your arches, your ankle, your lower leg, your knee, your hip, likes having that toe over in a more advantageous mm -hmm. position. So if, if well. <laughs> yeah, if they're, if, if it's rigid, it's probably not going to work. If you can't move the toes at all, then there's no point in trying to get them to space around something. They're just going to be 
yeah, can aggravated and okay then it's definitely worth a try um, and I know people were interested in learning about the modifications that we have um, because first and foremost let me tell you that one size never fits all and your left foot is different than your right foot you're going to want your metatarsal pads in slightly different positions you might want a slightly different shaped um, toe spacer for each foot and so we do have a video on our website it's how to modify correct toes and we're going to be adding another one to show how to modify it for a corn um, somewhere down the road when i catch up with ray and my camera um, but what we do show people is how to make some adjustments if you get the toe spacer and it just doesn't quite make your feet line up like that diagram because again you want the toes to come out in straight line with the bony ray that they support when we first put correct toes on, they're not always going to look like that. My shoe can be, or my foot can be a good example, um, because I did grow up in Western culture. I've got what in the ski industry they call the sixth toe, which is that little bump out by the, the pinky toe. And so if I put my correct toes on, and I was to follow that bony line, my pinky doesn't quite match up with it. And, but it's comfortable for my pinky toe to be pushed out, not quite looking pretty like it is in that picture, but it goes out and then my pinky goes a little bit further. If that was uncomfortable or painful for my foot, then I would consider a modification to make it less of a space here. And I brought some examples of like some modified correct toes where what we can do is trim off half of that spacer or trim off that whole portion of the spacer. The most important part about correct toes is they are there to regain the alignment of our great arch. Once we get that most powerful arch structurally sound underneath us, everything else kind of can go along for the ride in a comfy way. So you don't ever see us necessarily trimming off the whole toe, big toe one. Sometimes we might have just a half if someone has a hard time getting spacing material between their toes. Um, but you'll never see the whole great toe one gone because that's what this product is about. Um, if you put this on your foot and it's perfect for one, but your other foot didn't have such a bad bunion and you feel like you do want a little bit more stretch on that other foot, you can also add material to these spaces to help increase the amount of spread that you have. So what we do and show in our um, modification video is you can simply take an old shoe liner and ah, cut a little portion of it and then tweezers at home if you don't have a fancy doctor tong thing you just reach through the hole and pull it into that space and there's some additional spread for the great toe other things that sometimes people will bump into, um, if you have hammer toes or corns on them and it's bumping into things on there, you can just trim away a little portion of the correct toe. Um, you'll see the two sizes that we currently offer. We have the medium large size, which we say fits most men, size 11 and a half and up. And then we have the small medium size, which fits most women over size seven and most men under size 11 and a half. Later in 2013, we are coming out with an even smaller size. Unfortunately, we've been seeing lots of children in our clinic who are coming in with Taylor's bunions and bunions and hammer toes and crooked toes, um, often due to poor footing or poor fitting footwear. Um, so that size is coming out later next year as well. So we'll have another size to offer for you. Um, and you'll see that these don't have the same little bumps on. This was kind of the original design of the correct toes. And what we found is that for women with smaller feet, especially because of the more time in high heels and that toe extension and the fat pads moving out from underneath the metatarsal heads, just a lot more tender underneath the ball of the foot. And they were being bothered by some of these little bumps on there. And so we just changed the design of that smaller size to accommodate that. Um, we didn't get the same reports or experience with the medium large, so you haven't seen that change in design to it yet. Um, but if there is someone wearing this larger size and they're irritated by one of these nubs, you can just cut them off. It's medical grade silicone, even though if you cut it, it looks like it has a sharp edge, it's really soft. It does not rub or irritate. 
um, got folks that, well, one of the limitations, you should never strangulate your toes. If you have to really squeeze it on to get it around your toe, you don't, it's the same thing of putting a rubber band around your thumb, it turns all purple and you're like, wait, that's not a good thing. So one modification you can do for that is you can cut a little hole, but this is, you gotta be right on that edge. Again, if it's too tight, it's not gonna work for you. Um, but that increases the flexibility if you take a little hole punch or something. Um, same thing if someone has a sore on their top of their hammer toe or something, you can make a little space to accommodate that so it's not gonna be rubbed or impinged on. Um, so you said that um, <clears throat> the reason you have hammer toes is because the muscles on the top of your foot have, um, aren't stretched like they should be there. That's one up. of the conditions, yeah. Okay. So, that would hold the hammer toe down. Does that not, then? Not rigidly, but it helps gently start to coax them in that way. So um, does that stretch those muscles? For those with hammer toes, yes, it okay. does. Because when you try to get the spacer up over those knuckles that are popped up, they have to be pushed down just a little bit. And that's one of the big tricks for when you're trying to put these on too, and you're like, I can't get that toe to go through that one push down on that knuckle, and it'll pop the end of the toe right on out of there. So um, they do slowly help encourage the hammer toes to release. And one of the reasons that they are allowed, they can do that too is because the foot can find relaxed support through the bony tripod of the arches. And once you relax, then the gripping portion of hammer toes, it's kind of the self-propagating part of the hammer toe pathology is once you lose that stability and you feel like you don't have a good hold of the ground, then people tend to grip more, which further pulls us into that pathology and we don't feel like we're grounded and so they would grip more. So anything that we can do to start backing us out of that process to release just a little bit more one day, and then the next day just release a little bit more and a little bit more, we go the opposite direction. Yes. So before we start cutting away, and I can just visualize it, I've got five pieces now. Do you offer assistance at your mm -hmm. office to? Yeah, we absolutely do. That? If you come into our clinic, we can help you place met pads in the right place in your shoes. We do carry um, a limited number of shoes that work really well with Correctos, and we can help fit you with them as well. And if you're curious about um, modifications, we always recommend them sparingly. And then give it a couple of weeks to see how your foot adjusts to that one little modification. Um, you know, if you add material to the spacer, give your foot two weeks to see how it works with that before you even think about increasing the increment of spacing that you have in there. Um, and I should even say a time longer than two weeks. You know, give yourself a month if you can. Um, so modifications, um, approach them sparingly, see how it feels as is for your first experiments. Um, a lot of people, if it can represent an investment and it's a completely opposite direction than what most of our closets are filled with. And so unless we are loaded, we have to make these decisions one step at a time. My next footwear purchase, I'm gonna buy something that accommodates this, but I don't have money for that pair of shoes right now, so I'm gonna just work with these barefoot walking around my house or around my house with a sock over the top of them. Or around my house, I'll get a pair of toe socks that goes along with it. Um, if you have very slender toes or shorter toes and have experienced a problem of these slipping off, putting on a toe sock can put additional material that helps secure them into place. If correct toes are too much material, plain and simple for your foot, just starting with a toe sock can be the first step of releasing and can provide enough proprioceptive feedback that the, the nervous system goes, hey, there's something new going on down here and I have choices I never knew I had before. Um, and a point about that too, when you're at the shoe store, most folks go, how do your toes have room? And people move their toes up and down. It's just as important to see, can I spread them out? Yeah. Can you tell them the trick about how you take the sole out and step on top of it? Yes. The liner test. Um, one of the ways when you're at a shoe store to see if that shoe is, you know, besides just 
memorizing those bullet points of what are posture deforming features of shoes um, to know if, hey, if that shoe is really attractive, but it looks a little pointy, can I pull it off with my foot? Um, it's worth a try to pull the liner out and you put it on the floor if it has a removable liner and you put your foot on it. And see, if I step on this Ultra, you see the edge of my pinky toe and the edge of my big toe are still even right at the end of there. I'd probably be feeling a little bit of the side of my shoe. I love a lemming, and unfortunately, I've taken my liner out of my lemming. Maybe this one will work. What was the name of them? Um, they started as STEM, and then they got into a trademark battle with Nordstrom's and had to change their name to Lemming. And then they have a whole bunch of brand new models coming out this January. They have like a leather Oxford for men to wear in the office, they have a Mary Jane for women to wear. Um, in office and professional environments as well. They have a waterproof boot coming out for hiking and that kind of stuff. And, and um, their new name is going to be LEMS. LEM. They've just gone to LEMS, L-E-M-S. Um, but I can't, I'm, I'm budgeting, I'm saving money right now because I'm so excited to put my whole family and me into all of the new styles of these because these have become my absolute favorite shoe over the last year. Um, <clears throat> So there, you, if I step on this one, you can see that the liner encompasses my whole foot. I have to really spread to get off the edge of that liner. So this lemming shoe has the room my foot needs. If you have a narrower shoe, you might be able to pull off some fashionable options that are out there right now. Um, and one of the tricks is you can always go a size longer too. What you'll find is that brings that width of the ball a little bit closer to your toes. So not all of the attractive shoes out there are off limits right now, but they should be, unfortunately. Um, and then next year, you're, we're gonna see a lot of changes in the footwear industry and a lot more options that make this easier to go back to plumb and neutral relationship with the ground. If the shoe does not have a removable liner, you can take the, if I was testing my left foot, I would take the right shoe and flip it over. Okay, so see if I take this left shoe and put the bottom on, do the same test of standing on it on the floor. The sole is always going to be a pretty close approximation of what the footbed footprint. It'll be a little bit wider. You can assume that, okay, if I'm standing on this and my foot just barely squeezes, okay, I'm gonna get squeezed when I put the shoe over and put my foot in it. You mentioned starting with um, the other shoe, a little bit sturdier shoe first. Mm -hmm. So when you're mentioning all these kind of come out in this limb, then is that like an extra pair of shoes? Or how do you, how do you, you said to start sturdier and then move into that. Is that good? Um, let's can you back up a little bit and put the question to you and think of how do you feel when you spend time barefoot or do you spend time barefoot? Absolutely. So a lot of people will come home and they're like, oh, I wait all day to take my shoes off and then they walk around their house in socks and that's the most comfortable they feel all day. Being, if that's something that your foot does okay with, then it's worth an experiment. You know, go to the shoe store and try these on and you might discover, wow, I feel like I feel when I get home and take my shoes off at the end of the day. I'm going with these. But if that's an uncomfortable um, experience for you to go home and you know to have shoes off of your feet, if your feet have become very accustomed to support, then that's more likely you're gonna want something with some structure. Um, but I always, I, I'm the eternal optimist. I want to give feet a fighting chance and think that they will perform for me if I give them the chance to. So I encourage everybody to try it, see how you like it, and just spend more time not in shoes. What other questions do you guys have? What did I, what, what does it feel like you're missing? Nothing. I thought you explained it really well. Okay. Yeah. Which reminds me, plantar fasciitis. You had asked <laughs> about that. <clears throat> People go, how is having my toes spread out going to help me with plantar fasciitis? Um, Dr. Ray had the opportunity to study with a podiatrist. His name was Harvey Lamont, and he was also a tissue pathologist. So he looked at um, cellular level tissue issues for people. 
and when they were in, um, he had basically 50 of his patients that had plantar fasciitis, and they were taking them to surgery to release the plantar fascial ligament, which they just go in and they cut it to relieve the strain. And what he did is he harvested a piece of the plantar fascia, all 50 of these patients, and went in to go, I'm going to put it on a microscope and figure out what kind of itis, what kind of inflammation these people actually have. Not a single one had inflammation. What they had was tissue death or necrosis. And so the only reason why tissue dies like that is a blood flow issue. And so they said, well, let's rethink this whole plantar fasciitis issue. What could be cutting off that blood supply down there? Well, the blood supply for the plantar fascia and the calcaneal tubercle comes down posterior in our leg. It's called the tibialis posterior blood supply. And it goes deep to that adduct, pardon me, adductor hallucis muscle, the one that bowstrings out the bunion formation. And it goes it, through the fascial attachments as well of the flexor hallucis longus. So when you have a tube that's supposed to have unoccluded flow coming down to wash out and pr provide new nutrients to the tissue to regenerate, but then you take the cables and the cords that go past it and you stretch them. Because anytime my toe goes like that and I lift up like that, I'm pulling that flexor hallucis longus tendon tight and the abductor hallucis, um, pardon me, adductor hallucis taut over that calcaneal tubercle and the blood supply. So it's not completely cutting it off, but it cuts off just enough that you're not able to regenerate. And so by the end of the day, you're walking around with tissue that's dying, and the next morning your foot, you wake up and it's not moving, there's dead tissue and it hasn't been washed out, and that's that most painful step of the day, which then of course, kind of the same thing I was talking about hammer toes, when we have our first meeting of the ground, be a painful, noxious experience, our body and our nervous system's response to those kinds of experiences is to try to control it with tension, which then further creates more of the problem. So, when we can get our toes plumb and level and rebalance the tension relationships around our ankle and our blood supply, we start to get the actual blood flow that we need and people with plantar fasciitis problems actually get it to go away. Um, that's one of the things you'll hear with traditional plantar fasciitis treatment. If people put orthotics underneath there, you know, it's something they wrestle with for years. Oh yeah, it comes back at least once or twice a year, and you know, there's no solution. I just manage it. Well, we've, we've discovered there's a solution for the right people. And again, the people who are engaged in the process, conscious of their health, want to feel their sensations, want to respond to them as a responsible owner of the body, that kind of thing, then there's absolutely a solution for you. What about a uh, bone spur on the heel? Does that help? The bone spur itself is often not the painful structure. I was, I was just asking Dr. Ray about this the other week, of like, what about the bone spur there? And um, because the bone spur is created from that over-tensioning, that attenuation of the plantar fascia. But when you get plumb and level, the bone spur itself is not in a place where you're going to be stepping on it, creating any sort of pain. So bone spurs themselves can be helped when you take away that stress that helped the body create um, the bone in the first place. It gives the osteoclast, the cells that eat bone, the chance to go, hey, we don't need the structure here anymore. It might just dissolve. Aaron, I just want to say, you're, while you were talking, I was thinking about how a few weeks ago I bought some Nike shoes mm -hmm. um, in a, you know, at a running store, and I kept telling the salesperson, I was like, these squeeze my toe, you know, my toe's over here, my big bone's over here. I was like, I don't want to spend so much money if toes are just going to switch my shoes. And he was like, what do you mean? I was like, pretty much every running shoe I've ever seen, they squish your toes. That's not comfortable. So it's just funny how it's, it's common sense and I love what you're saying, but it's kind of weird how the majority of society doesn't think that. It's kind of odd, you know. So now I'm regretting my own shoes. <laughs> That's cool. Where'd you get them? Um, I got them at Roadrunner Sports. Okay. So a lot of the running places are you know, that's their business too. They want to have happy customers. Mm -hmm. And if you yeah. go back, the, mm -hmm. often they'll go the extra mile to make sure they get you into the right thing. So yeah, if you're not happy, sure advocate for yourselves out there, definitely. I mean, they didn't, you know, they're not Nike, they didn't shoes, but 
it's just yeah just and that's um you know i was thinking about the whole conundrum of shoe buying the other day where that industry is driven by the already powerful vested interests of why shoes are shaped that way in the first place. And you look at shoe history and you go back to those old wooden clogs and being bent up and when they became something that were available to the masses, cobblers had to go, well, how do we make a whole bunch of these things really fast and easy and get them affordable to the masses? Well, that's where traditional last technology came from. It's not necessarily foot shaped, it's how it makes a cobbler's job easy to make a shoe really fast shaped. And that's where the industry comes from. And the education of the store employees often comes from the industry reps that their education comes from the manufacturers you know and I I'm you know, throwing stones at glass houses here I work for a manufacturer in my education well I found my way to this from healing education and so I wasn't just trying to make a buck in the shoe industry so it's a little bit different model um, and then the other issue too is if we go out to a shoe store and we're like I saw these ultras and that model looked awesome it's gonna work for my foot and you go into the store and you're like it's my time to buy shoes and they don't have your size. A lot of people will settle for something else that they have on the, the shelf that's not good. And so um, it takes a little bit of forethought to get through this process and to be able to make those incremental purchases of footwear um, that are going to be healthy for you. But I encourage you guys to start thinking along those lines now. Um, can I take back my running shoes and get you know a pair of ultras to start experimenting in? Um, Fit Right Northwest is the shoe store in Northwest Portland that probably has the greatest selection of minimalist shoes and different varying degrees of drop. So if you guys want to go into a place where you can try on a whole slew of stuff that's going to be more beneficial to a natural foot shape, um, Fit Right is definitely a good destination for that. Um, these are my favorite running shoes, except I have a gray pair. So. And, well, shoes, my other favorite running thing would be Hirachis, and that just blew my mind to be like, what? I, my foot likes running in this little slab of leather with these straps on it? Okay. Um, and that's been the fun part for me is over the last year I actually picked up a running habit. I've always enjoyed, like, board sports and stuff, but I always hated running because I would come home with painful, numb feet. Um, and it's only been through rehabilitating my feet that I got to the place where there's any joy in it whatsoever. Blows my mind that I'm enjoying it. And in Hirachis. Lambs. Um, but that brings us to 1 o'clock. I want to stick to our schedule and honor that you guys have clients coming in. Um, any additional questions that anybody has? I have some business cards. You guys are welcome to reach out to me via my correct toes info. I'm take one pass around. How much for the little toe guys? Ah, the correct toes costs $65. Today, if you want to pick up a pair for you or a family member, we are offering them for $50 here at the event. We can take debits and credit card payments if you didn't come prepared with cash or check. Um, but you're welcome to pick up correct toes at a discount today, which you'll often never find them discounted other than at an event like this. Um, so if anybody wants to pick up a pair of correct toes, go ahead and talk to Lisa and I. Okay. Uh, this model of Lemming is $90, and their boots and like the Mary Janes that, that are coming out next year look like they're going to be around $125 is going to be the cost for those. It's um, not bad. No, it's, it's not. And for how comfy they are. That's the other really neat thing. Um, as you rehabilitate your foot and balance out the tension relationships, you quit wearing through shoes so fast because it's the imbalances of tension that creates the torsional frictional forces that wears through our soft goods on our feet. So when you can just roll lightly through a step and not put all that frictional torsion in there, shoes last a lot, lot longer. So. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes, You're welcome, everybody. You. Yeah, thank you for listening. Thank you for your great questions. Thank you. I love running. I love running. I love running. I love running. I love running.